What is going on everybody? Welcome back to Overkill Projects. Just got back from a little trip to the north. How you guys like my new shirt? It's pretty slick, right? In the last video, I said that we would get started on this guy, the STM32 G431 Nucleo board, and we are gonna do just that today. So let's get started. Hey guys, so I was editing the footage for this video when I realized that it's like twice as long as I wanted it to be. So I'm gonna break it into two chunks. Today we're gonna to be part one. Uh, I'm gonna cover the hardware and the configuration of the hardware in Cube MX, uh, which if you don't know what that is, not important. I'll talk about it in the video. And then next time is going to be um, about the programming of the STM32 Nucleo device and getting the Blinky to blink. So that's what you're here for. Uh, check the description for links or maybe I'll put up one of these, you know, these like little card things that come up up here. So you can click on that if that's what you're looking for. But yeah, otherwise, uh, let's get started. All of the STM32 Nucleo boards have either jumpers, if it's one of the bigger boards, or solder bridges, if it's one of these little guys. In this case, it's the solder bridges, which they're a little tougher to work with, but they're smaller, so that's why they have them. The idea is pretty simple. There's actually more functionality on the microcontroller than you could possibly have at the breakout pins. So you need some way to be able to configure the hardware to you know, do the different things if you're trying to enable different parts of the microcontroller. And so the way they do it is with the solder bridges but it can be a little bit confusing to know what solder bridges you have to do so let's take a look at that process the first thing you're going to do and by the way before i get started all the links to uh you know all the documentation and and like where you download the software and all that sort of stuff you guys can just check that out it'll be down in the description with all the other nonsense but yeah look down there for the links otherwise just sort of try to follow along with what i'm doing so you're going to navigate over to the nucleo 32 uh, evaluation tools site thing for this specific board. You'll see down there, there's like a, a resources tab. You click on that, you go down to user manuals. And once you're there, you're gonna take a look for user manual 2397, which is the user manual for this particular device. You're gonna click on that, it'll download it. This thing has a whole bunch of information about the Nucleo 32 aspects of this board. There's also a user manual, and I'll link that in down below as well, for the controller itself. And now that will have all the information for you know how you actually would use the microcontroller I'll warn you, that is a very long and very scary document. This one's a little bit easier to take a look at. So you're gonna open that up and then you're gonna go down. You'll see eventually table nine, which is the solder bridge configuration table. Now, when you get down there, you're gonna see this like table. It's gonna say the solder bridge is gonna say what they're gonna do. In this case, I undid the solder bridges that pertain to what you see at the top there. It looks like TVCP or something like that. It's sort of like a like a serial out, sort of like the Arduino serial monitor stuff. And we're not gonna use that, so nuts to that. Also, you guys, we're not gonna use the uh, I squared C, the IIC interface in this. And so we're gonna have to take the solder bridges off of uh, SB2 and 3. And now one of the really cool things about this board, and one of the reasons that I use this one over some of the other ones, not only does it have one of the newest STM32 microcontrollers on it, this uh, new G series, the G431, but it also has on it a high speed external ceramic clock, like already on the board, ready to roll. But you need to enable, you need to connect a couple different solder bridges to get this to work. So in this case, we need to connect solder bridges nine and 10. Now, when it comes to soldering and unsoldering these things, uh, it's kind of a pain, I'm not gonna lie, but the idea is pretty simple. You just put your soldering iron up against the zero ohm resistors that form the bridges you put maybe just a drop of solder on there so that it activates the flux, or you, you, know, you know, you can just add some, some actual flux. And then that should get everything moving and just sort of go back and forth between each side of that zero ohm resistor, you know, like a second on this side, a second on that side, a second, a second, a second. Eventually the thing will just pop right off. And now your options for adding solder bridges is kind of more interesting. You could take those zero ohm resistors or other zero ohm resistors that you might happen to have laying around, and you can use those to form the new connections, which is what I did on uh, solder bridges nine and 10, which you can see in the picture or you can just form an actual solder bridge using solder. You just sort of put your soldering iron across the, the two pads of the solder bridge, dab some solder there until it forms a nice little bridge right across the two pads, and then just remove the, the 
soldering iron and boom, there you go. You've got yourself a little soldering bridge. You can see I have both different types on this board. Uh, I kind of actually prefer just doing the little solder bridges. They're easier. Uh, it's kind of a pain to sit there with the little tweezers and stick the such a tiny resistor in place. But now for software development, we have some options. If you go to the STM32 dev tools site, you'll notice if you take a look at the little drop down that they have on the side that there are 25, or well, at least at the time that I'm making this video, there are 25 different IDEs that they have listed on their website that you can use uh, to develop software for this platform. And obviously that's probably not all of them. There's probably more than that. Uh, and it really, they run the whole gamut. There's really nice uh, pay commercially available IDEs, things like Kyle and IAR and uh, Seger. These are very nice IDEs. We're not going to use them because they cost an awful lot of money. And if you're really thinking about using this as a development tool early on, you're probably not going to want to invest, you know, thousands of dollars in an IDE. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use ST's you know, home built, home brew tool. They made uh, uh, their own little package. It's called STM32 Cube IDE. It's based on the Eclipse IDE, which is a really solid platform. ST built their STM32 Cube IDE on top of that. Uh, it has built in all the stuff that you need to uh, not only develop the software, but also to debug. There's like a whole debug stack on there that makes it way easier to debug than uh, it would be if we made all this stuff on the Arduino IDE, which is also available, but is terrible. So I'm guessing you guys kind of understand the drill here. You just download the software. You'll see there's like a little download button. I think it makes you uh, log in. And then once you log in, it'll automatically start the download. Once the download's done, you just unzip the zip file it gives you, run the, the exe file, uh, install it wherever you want, all that sort of good stuff. Then once it's installed, go ahead and fire it up. And one of the things that you're gonna notice right away when you start this up is that it asks you what workspace you wanna work in for you. If you've never done this before, you, you're not used to working with Eclipse and you don't know what you're doing, you can probably just use the default for now. I'm gonna go ahead and make a new workspace just for this channel or you know, just for this channel for now anyway. We'll call it YouTube Overkill. And then I'll go ahead and you know everything that we do will stay in this workspace. It's just a nice way for you to uh, categorize your different sets of projects. Maybe you have a handful of different clients. You could have different workspaces for each client. And then in each workspace, you're gonna have the projects that you did for that client all sort of listed in the project explorer, which we'll see in a second. So now once you get past that and you put in your workspace, you're gonna get in. If it's your first time starting this up, you're gonna see like this welcome introduction screen and it'll give you the option to start a new project from here, open an existing project, whatever. Uh, or if you don't have this screen and you just see like sort of the editor and the project uh, explorer over on the side and that sort of stuff, then you can go ahead, uh, click on file, click on new, and then you're gonna go down to an STM32 project. So now you should be confronted with a pop-up dialog thing that is sort of like, it has a whole bunch of different uh, microcontrollers listed. And then there's some stuff on the left that enables you to search for specific microcontrollers more easily. We know exactly what microcontroller we're looking at here because it said on the box, it said STM32G431. So we're gonna go ahead and type that into the search field up there. And you'll notice on the packaging that not only is it an STM32G431, but it is actually also a 431KB. It, you should be able to see that a little further down in the packaging. So we're going to select that one. And now you'll notice in the new window or in the, the new material that pops up in the window to the, the right in the middle there, uh, that one of these says Nucleo on it. So that's great. That's exactly what we're dealing with. So you're gonna click that option and then you're gonna click next. And now from here, you guys should see a little project setup configuration window thing. And the only thing that you really need to do here is put in a name for your project. In this case, I'm gonna call this one Blinky. And just make sure down below that you have the C language chosen as the, the language for this project. That's what we're gonna use here and probably for just about everything going forward. Now you go ahead and you hit the okay button and it pops up with this little window that says, do you wanna change perspectives? So uh, an element of Eclipse that's kind of interesting, uh, I like it, is that there are different perspectives for different tasks. So in this case, we're actually going to be opening a new Cube MX project. Now Cube MX is actually a standalone piece of software also made by ST that enables you to quickly generate code for the different microcontrollers. It takes care of a whole bunch of the boilerplate stuff, sort of sets up a whole like structured code output thing that you can then 
use as a basis for your application. And as you'll see, the code that it generates is pretty understandable, even to people who are new to this. And, uh, and there's no reason that you can't look through that code. It just means that, you know, if you use CubeMX to initialize things, then you don't have to do that work. Now, as for perspectives, there's this CubeMX perspective. We'll see later that there's a perspective for uh, when you're actually editing C or C++ code, that's a different perspective. And when we go ahead and debug this thing, that'll be yet another perspective. But we're gonna go ahead and say, yeah, switch perspectives and we will take a look at CubeMX. So now that you've chosen your microcontroller, you're gonna be confronted with a little like image of the microcontroller with all the, the pins sort of sticking out, you know, every old which way. Now, this is something that makes the process a little bit difficult when you're dealing with a nucleo board uh, because the nucleo board, the pin out, you know, you need to know the pin out for understanding which pin on the microcontroller associates to which pin on the nucleo device, but whatever, because for this project, we're only using one pin and that pin is PA9, which associates to pin A1 on the nucleo 32 device. So there's a whole bunch of stuff on this screen that you can explore and, you know, we'll take a look at that as we do more projects and as there's other reasons to look at them. But for today, I'm just gonna go ahead and we're gonna click PA9. You're gonna see this like little thing pop up uh, and it'll give you all the different options that that pin can have you know some of them will be different peripherals some of them will just be different like gpio options and different pins will have different options you know you could click on different ones and see that there are different options but for pin pa1 all we need to do is click on it and go up to gpio output and now if you take a look a little to the left you'll see there's things like system core analog timers whatever uh, click on system core you'll see under there it says gpio if you click that little option, it will open up another window or it should open up another window. If not, then there's these little toggle arrows to the left and right, you know, you can hit them. And in here, you'll see all the pins that are configured as GPIO pins, you know, one way or another, even if they're using alternate functions, they'll be listed here. So now if you click on the pin that you just selected, which was PA9, it should be the only thing in this list, then you'll see that there are all these different little options that you can do for it. And now we're not gonna touch any of these options for this project. Totally unnecessary, just running at normal speed and everything is perfectly fine for this. The only thing that we might wanna make sure is that the output is set to low to start with. That way, when we first plug in the device, you know, it's not just automatically powering whatever the thing is, in this case, the LED, but it really shouldn't be that big a deal. So you can kind of just leave everything the way it is. That should be fine. And now we're gonna go ahead and turn on two more pins, but they don't actually correspond to any pins on the Nucleo 32 device. Instead, they correspond to the high-speed external oscillator. So now you're gonna go give a click to pins PF0 and PF1, and you're gonna scroll each one of those to the RCC uh, functionality peripheral option, which in one of them is going to be RCC oscillator in, and the other one will be RCC oscillator out. By enabling these pins, you have turned on the clock control subsystem of this microcontroller. So now when we go up to the top in CubeMX, you'll see that there's, you know, clock configuration tab. When we click that, there'll be a whole bunch of new stuff that's open for us to do. If we scroll around a little bit, you're gonna see there's like, you know, a whole bunch of clock options that are gonna be on the left. Uh, and on the right, you sort of see the, uh, the output speeds for the different peripherals and all that sort of stuff. And now when we make changes to things further to the left, they will trickle down to the stuff that's on the right. So right now you see that, you know, it's set for 16 megahertz and, and that's great. That's using the high speed internal oscillator. But we went through the work to, you know, make the solder bridge and turn on the pins. So let's use the high speed external crystal. So if we scroll down a little bit, we see over here that there's like this HSE field that's populated with eight megahertz right now. But the onboard oscillator is 24 megahertz. So we're gonna wanna go ahead and change that eight megahertz to 24. So now we change it to 24 and we take a look at the peripheral pins and everything and we see that the clock speed is still at 16 megahertz. And that's because we didn't choose the high speed external, we're still using the high speed internal option. So if we scroll back on over to the left and we find that we where we can change it to HSE, we click the HSE option. Now when we move over, we see sure enough, everything is set to 24 megahertz. But guys, it turns out that this thing could do a lot better. We can enable the PLL, which is the phase lock loop. Uh, there's an internal phase lock loop that enables us to bump up the clock speed of this chip by multiplying and dividing the input from the clock 
in order to make new clock speeds. So you'll see that if we enable the PLL, that now we get like this little red box here and that's because we're not dividing it by enough. You have to divide, I think by more than two in order for this to work. So, you know, if we pick the different options, you'll see it'll, you know, change how the clock works. We can change what it is divided by initially. Uh, that'll change stuff. We can change the multiplier and then we can change the secondary divider, the divider that comes out of the multiplier. And actually you'll notice that there's several dividers after the multiplier and that enables you to sort of, you know, custom tune the different peripherals to the exact speed that you want them to work at. And once you're done fiddling around, uh, I'm gonna set this thing to divide initially by three and then multiply by 32. And then I'm just gonna leave the other guys to divide by two down there. And that's gonna give us a clock speed of 128 megahertz. And the only reason I really went ahead and made it 128 megahertz is because 128 divides easily by two. So when we do the math for the timer, just super easy. Plus 128 megahertz is way faster than we need to blink a little LED light. Uh, it's even gonna be way faster than we need to do this entire project, but that's okay. That's where we're gonna run it at. So, you know, set it to that and then we'll we'll move on. Now, head back out to the pinout and configuration tab. We're gonna do a little more work. You're gonna go over to the left. You're gonna see timers, uh, drop that down. And then you'll see in there, Tim two, which is timer two. You're gonna click on timer two. And now that's gonna open this new window. At the top, you're gonna see a whole bunch of different options. The timers on these devices are just super extreme. They can do tons and tons of different things. They're very cool, but we're gonna use it in probably the most basic way imaginable. We're just gonna use it to count up to a specific value and then trigger an interrupt. And then on that interrupt, we'll have it turn the LED on or off. It'll just toggle that LED. So now in these configuration options, we're just gonna choose the input source as the internal clock. That means, you know, the, the internal clock for the microcontroller, which in this case happens to be an external clock so the you know the nomenclature might be a little confusing there but yeah the internal clock is the one you want so choose that and then turn your attention down below to the many many options down there uh, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to hit the clock with a prescaler of 64,000. now if you do the quick mental math uh, 128 million which is 128 megahertz divided by 64,000 leaves us with 2,000 clock cycles per second i want this thing to turn on and off, I want it to toggle once every half of a second. So now when we go down below to the counter period, we can set that to be 1000. And that means that, you know, the interrupt should be triggered every one half of a second, every 64 million clock cycles. And when we go to save it, it's gonna ask us if we wanna generate code. Now, that this is the whole point of using CubeMX is that it's gonna take all that configuration that we just did and it's going to automatically generate all the startup code and all the boilerplate that we need so that we already have a project started and ready to go. So go ahead and click yes, let it generate, it'll take a second. Then all of a sudden in the project explorer on the left, you're gonna notice you know, a whole bunch of new files. There'll be like a little file structure. There should be some folders and all that sort of stuff. All right, and that should do it for part one. I think this is a really good place to stop. Next time in part two, we will pick it up right where we left off. The code's already generated, ready to go. And so we can just start programming and getting our thing blinking. Uh, so make sure you check that out. And as always, if you enjoyed yourself or learned something, you know the drill, hit the old thumbs up, subscribe, the alerts bell, check the description for all those links I was talking about, um, comment down below, and I will see you next time.